Good morning. Good morning. Brian is in the house. And we are glad. We are so happy that you have joined us both in person and online. I hope that you are having a great start to your day. Would you please stand to worship with us? Good morning. Um, before I forget, Nick talked to me this morning. Lots of apricots, right? Nectarines, excuse me. Lots of nectarines in the fridge, in the kitchen. Go help you selfie. Um, and then we also need um, uh, people to help bring in 600 pounds of sugar that's in four pound bags uh, that Nick has in his vehicle. So after church, go to the parking lot, find Nick, grab some sugar and bring it in and he'll tell you where to put it. Okay? Um, I want to extend a great 
big, humongous thank you to um, the helpers that we had on Wednesday night and yesterday, um, cleaning out uh, the basement. I'll just, we'll just call it that. Um, if you go to the fellowship hall, you will see the results of all of that work. Um, and it's a good thing we had youngins here to help because we'd still be carrying it. So um, if you are interested in any of the stuff that's in the fellowship hall, um, that's in the free area, it's free. And you can help yourself. And if you have people that you know that might want it, they can come and get it. Next Sunday is the last day for the congregation to have their pick. Then we're going to um, make it available out in the, in the web lands um, and let people know that we have it. And if they want to come and help themselves, they can. We will also be finding um, agencies that can maybe use some of the stuff as well. Our final day for purging, cleaning out, having stuff available to people will be Saturday, October 14th. We will have a dumpster uh, and whatever's left, what hasn't been spoken for, what hasn't been claimed, will find its demise in a dumpster. Okay. Um, we will have an opportunity f next week for those of you who have wanted to help, but physically it's a little bit challenging to come and tote things around. We will have an opportunity for you to be able to participate, but that's next week. Okay, uh, anything else announcement-wise that I was supposed to say? Yes, sir. Okay. C4, middle school, high schoolers, two to four. Be here or don't. Okay. Um, so this week I have, um, I've been thinking uh, along the lines of what Bill has brought out in sermons recently about names and the importance of names. Um, that uh, Isaac's name means Laughter? Anybody? Yes. Okay. Uh, but specifically, I was thinking about the names for God that we find in Scripture. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, as part as our focus for call to worship, um, list off six six names for God that we find in Scripture. There are like almost thirty some. Um, El Shaddai means God Almighty. Elohim, which is a plural in Hebrew that helps us understand the unity of God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides, because he sees the need beforehand. He already knows there's a need, and he provides. Philippians 4.19 says, My God will fulfill every need of yours according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, who restores. Psalm 103.3 says, he forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. So it's not just physical diseases, but he restores us um, due to our sin. Uh, El Roy, God who sees me. Psalm 33, 18. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, waiting for his love. He sees you. He knows you. He knows your heart. 
He knows your hurts. You're not invisible, even though sometimes we do feel invisible. And finally, El Sali, God is my rock. Whoop. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The names of God help us to see his character as we are in relationship with him. And that's the reason we come together, is because each of us are in different spots in our relationship with God, but we can come and share in worship and lifting him up because he knows us, he loves us, and he doesn't uh, ignore us. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that, um, that although you are the creator of everything, even to the smallest of atoms and the largest of universes, you've made each of us individually and you know us, and you love us, and you care about us, and you provide our strength, and you are unchanging, and you are faithful, and we can rely on you when things get crazy around us. Father, I pray that you will accept our feeble attempts to tell you how much we love you as we lift our voices in song, as we lift you up in prayer, as we share at your table with you, as we hear your word. Lord, accept our offering. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, it says, Abraham had faith. So when God tested him, Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham had held on tightly to the promises, but he was about to offer his one and only son. God had said to him, your family line will continue through Isaac. Even so, Abraham was going to offer him up. Abraham did this because he believed that God would, could even raise the dead. In a way, he did receive Isaac back from death. If you watch highlight reels of famous athletes, you might think they were greater at the sport than you remember. John Reed tells a story about these video highlights. 
He said, the wor world of sports provides a beautiful picture of God's grace. We see it when the sportscaster shows highlight reels of our favorite athletes from years gone by. In the editing process, they extract the mistakes, the fumbles, the strikeouts, and the missed shots. Instead, every time Michael Jordan or Larry Bird shoot the ball, they make the basket. If all you knew about these legends was what you saw from a highlight reel, you'd think they never missed a shot. The good news is that God has a highlight reel for each one of us, but it's edited by his grace. Hebrews 10, 11 through 12 and 17 says, Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. When God reviews the highlights of our lives, he doesn't see the sin that has stained our lives. It has been edited by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now through Christ, when God plays back our highlight reels, he sees the holiness and righteousness of Jesus. Hebrews 10.10 says, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. As we gather around the Lord's table today, may we remember that through God's grace, it was his body that sacrificed for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your grace. It is amazing. Lord, we thank you so much that when we come to you, you just ride away our sins. Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made to make that happen. As we gather around your table today, Lord, we thank you for the blood, and we thank you for your body. In your name I pray, amen.
As we partake together of the bread, we remember Christ's body that was sacrificed for us. And as we partake of the juice, may we remember Christ's blood shed on the cross for us. At this time, the kids and anyone helping with Kid City is dismissed. for you. <laughs> Before I preach, a quick thank you. I got a gift this morning. There's a shirt down here, but I also got... I'm a Braves fan. And uh, here in the land of Lincoln, where you're either a Cubs fan or a Cardinals fan, I kind of stand out, I guess. Without going into all of it, when my brother came home from Vietnam and got married, lived briefly near where we had grown up, but wound up moving to Atlanta for a while, um, I became an Atlanta Braves fan, watching Hank Aaron and Phil Necro and that era of ball player. So, yeah, Deb went down and went to a ball game. And she said she almost got beat up getting my T-shirt. 
It was one of those that gets thrown out into the audience, and, and she jumped up. She said, those Braves fans didn't know this old lady could jump like that. <laughs> so thanks, Deb. It's awesome. I love it. I love it. Sometimes God asks the difficult, the very nearly impossible of us. If you remember, he asked a man we only know as the rich young ruler to sell everything that he had to give the proceeds to the poor and then to come and follow Jesus. That young man couldn't do it, and he went away sad. He asked something similar of Peter and Andrew, James and John. He asked them to leave their fishing careers, all of their boats and their equipment behind, and to cease being fishermen, to become fishers of men. And they said, we will. And the four of them would become four of the twelve apostles. Has God ever asked you to do something to which your initial response was an incredulous, say what? Did I, did I hear you right, God? You're asking me to, what? I'll be honest, I've been there. Maybe you have been as well. As we continue in the book of Genesis, we've come to chapter 22. And it is an interesting chapter. Because God puts Abraham's faith to the test. We read about it initially just in the first couple of verses. Chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, speaks of what I simply call Abraham's test. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Boy, what does that do to you from your Christian perspective? What kind of a God is this who is called Abraham, who has promised to him a child, this Isaac of whom he has spoken, and now he says, I want you to make a burnt offering out of him? That's a little bit disconcerting. That's a little bit troubling. That's a, say what? Did I hear you right? But the key word here is tested. Not tempted. James chapter 1 verse 13 reminds us, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But a test. God is looking for something that well, let's be honest, he probably already knows. But does Abraham know it about himself? God tests the depth, the reality, the obedience of Abraham by asking him to make a burnt offering of the son of promise, of Isaac, of laughter. Abraham, if you've been following along, has shown moments of tremendous strength, and he has shown moments of glaring weakness. I don't know how many of you are reading the Ragamuffin Gospel, but Brennan Manning speaks of his own life. On page 25 of his book, he writes this. He says, when I get honest, I admit I am a bundle of paradoxes. I believe, and I doubt. I hope. And I get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I'm trusting and suspicious. I'm honest. And I still play games. Aristotle said I am a rational animal. I say I'm an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. To live by grace, means to acknowledge my whole life story. The light side 
and the dark. In admitting my shadow side, I learn who I am and what God's grace means. As Thomas Merton put it, a saint is not someone who is good, but someone who experiences the goodness of God. Abraham needs to experience the goodness of God. He needs to understand his light side and his dark side. He needs to acknowledge before God that he has had moments of tremendous strength and moments of glaring weakness. And so God tests him. Tests are not always easy, though, are they? Whether it was an academic 